Welcome to Lydia Finette's Claim Your Confidence, a podcast that will introduce you to the most powerful women in the world as they talk about their own confidence journey. No matter what obstacles you face, Claim Your Confidence will inspire you, motivate you, and give you a roadmap to live the life you want. So, are you ready to claim your confidence? Welcome back to Claim Your Confidence, everyone. So seated across from me is a bundle of energy and joy. <laughs> Kendra Bracken Ferguson walked in here with a huge smile on her face, and we've been laughing ever since the minute she walked in. She is the founder and CEO of Brain Trust and Brain Trust Founder Studio. She has the Business of the Beat podcast and a new book coming out this spring. Kendra, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, Lydia, this is so <laughs> funny. You were right. Since the moment I walked in, we've been laughing and smiling, and my, my face is hurting because I'm having such a good time with you. I know, and we still have 40 minutes left, so get ready. It's all happening. Well, I want to hear a little bit about you and growing up. You grew up in Texas. Yes. So tell me about growing up in Texas. I'm from Louisiana, so as a feather oh, a yes. southerner, I understand the heat. We're like kindred spirits. We get it. Um, it's so funny because I was born in Germany because my parents were in the military. Oh. And we moved to Abilene, Texas. And then um, I grew up a little bit in Abilene. Then we moved to Round Rock, Texas. We lived in Houston, Texas. I have family in Austin, but I am like a Texas girl. And it's so funny because I always kind of trace myself back to this movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. You and I will appreciate it. I have it still on VHS in black and white. <laughs> if go. anyone knows what VHS means. Um, and one of the key pieces of that movie was when they're talking about shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. And I always think about that. Literally, my mom and I were just talking about how that was so near and dear to me growing up. And I always said it. And then when we think about your confidence, like having the confidence to use Texas as my base, but then grow and expand into all the things I'm doing. It's so funny because I feel like every year that passes, I feel almost closer to Louisiana in a, in a lot of ways, especially having lived in New York for so long. I feel like for a long time I tried to suppress the fact that I was from Louisiana. <laughs> and then sometime in the past decade, I've been like, wait, this is such a part of who I am and such a great part of who I am. And I feel like it's come full circle and embraced it. So I love to hear you say that. So who were you growing up in Texas? Did you come with the smile and energy that you have now? Has this oh always gosh. existed? It has. It's like... It's the gift and curse of my personality, like <laughs> the smiles, the bubbles. But then we always joke. It was like when I was in elementary school, I was like, oh, my gosh, how's middle school? When I was in middle school, I was stressed about high school. High school, I was stressed about college. Like, I've always just been so dedicated. I was a cheerleader. I was the president of this. I Before I turned 16, because in Texas, you have to be 16 to work. I remember being 15 and scouting out what jobs I was going to have. Mm -hmm. And the day that I turned 16, I had my job. I went to work, had my first day at Sonic. So it's so funny because I always had this drive to like work and to do things. And I saw my mom and I traveled with her. And it's just funny because the older we get, we do think about our roots and we think about our community and we think about going home. Like, yeah. I'll go home sometimes just to sleep. Yes. And it's a different kind of sleep in adulthood whenever you are blessed to go back to your childhood neighborhood and your room, which as soon as I left college, my mom immediately turned into something else. But <laughs> she was like, and this is a closet. And now. this is, yes, this is my closet. Thank you, child. Um, <laughs> but it, it really, it's so true to me. And I always talk about the fact that when I was in sixth grade, I was watching the president give a speech and someone walked up and handed him a piece of paper. And I said to my mom, who is that? Like, who is that person? And she said, that's the press secretary. And I said, that's what I want to be. Oh, wow. And from sixth grade on, I went to Purdue University for the School of Liberal Arts. I studied PR. My first jobs were PR. And I've evolved from that ever since. But so much of the grounding came from Texas and my roots mm -hmm. and my family. I love that so much. I also love that you had a vision for what you wanted at such an early age. I find that in my own life, I feel exactly the same way. The first time I came to New York, I was 10 years old, and my mom said that I turned to her and I was like, I'm going to live here one day. And she said that, you know, I went 
into the Northeast, but then back down to the South for college. And I just always knew I would end up in New York. Like there was just yes. something about life on Fast Forward that I loved. And so I completely understand that and love that. You going to Purdue is a great story, too. And it, it has roots in Louisiana through a singular football player named Drew Brees. Yes. Will you tell me a little <laughs> bit about that story? Because I listened to this on a podcast and I laughed so hard. So how did you end up going to Purdue? Oh, my gosh. It's so funny. So um, I was a cheerleader in high school. And, you know, Texas is like we are bleeding cheerleading oh, and yes. football and Friday all Night Lights. things. Yeah. It is real. And I remember we played against Drew Brees and everyone was like, oh, my God, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees. And at the time I was dating a football player and we had been we were like the eighth grade king and queen. And so we were getting ready to graduate. And I was like, I have to go to a Big Ten or a Big 12 school. Like, I don't want to stay in Texas, but I have to go to one of these schools. And so my then boyfriend got a scholarship at Purdue, which was crazy because Drew Brees was going and everyone's like, <laughs> oh my God, we're all, to Drew going, Brees. all roads lead to Drew Brees. And we're like, we're all going to Purdue. And he had gotten scholarships from all these other places. But as it were, in high school, we literally broke up. And he had this great opportunity to go on other football scholarships. But I was so focused on Purdue and I had a scholarship and so I was like, we're breaking up and I'm going to Purdue. <laughs> with and or without you. With or without you. And it was so funny because then I was a gold duster and there was Drew. And I really loved college. Mm. Like, I was so fortunate. And to your point, it was always, and I say, like, I used to talk about It's a Wonderful Life. There was nothing crummy about my town. It was more just this ambition to, like, see more and yeah. to see the world and yeah. to experience it. And I remember freshman year at Purdue and it was snowing and like in Austin, it was hot, but we didn't have snow. And I remember being so cold and like oh. sitting on the sidewalk and being like, mom, get me out of here. You love <laughs> me here. Um, but it was, it was such a great experience. And funny enough, I just did a keynote at Purdue for the School of Hospitality. And we were talking about, I was saying to the students like, the future is so bright for you. Like yeah. you have all these opportunities, but also enjoy your time in college. Like let's not grow up so fast. Yeah. Like enjoy it. Enjoy actually going to class and being on campus and seeing your friends every single day. Like yeah. as adults, we love going to these conferences because it's like a big summer camp. Yeah, it's exactly. like a big reunion it's like, of friends. Do we get to sleep in a dorm room <laughs> yeah. and see people and hang out with no responsibility in the morning? That sounds great. Exactly. Only we're staying at the Ritz. We're not yeah. staying in the dorm. But yes. <laughs> Elevated and much appreciated. Yes, absolutely. Life gets better as you get older and yes. you, you start working. That's what exactly. you're going to tell the college students. Like there is an un there is an end game that moves you out of a single room with a twin bed that you <laughs> yes. might be sharing with someone else. Who knows? So oh your gosh. time at Purdue, is that where you decided you were going to be the press secretary? What happened next? So I went to school to study PR, which was my whole trajectory. I ended up um, writing for the Black Cultural Center newsletter. Mm -hmm. I became a senior editor. I became president of my sorority. You're I just worked checking at the boxes. You're like, Girl, homecoming yes. queen, oh, it president was all of the thing. sorority. I like interned in the athletic department like I it's so funny because I talked to my strollers now and they were like did you really want to be in a sorority I was like now now I did but back then I had a list yes what are the things <laughs> that I need that to box. do <laughs> and I was like this is what I'm gonna do yeah. and it was it was it was great and what ended up happening was I worked all through college and I said, I want to get an internship at one of the top five PR agencies in the world. Oh, wow. I'm only applying to them. This is what I want to do. Just like you, I was like, I, I want to go to New York. And so I applied, I got interviews, and my best friend, who's still my best friend to this day, Brandon Carter and Kristen Bright, we're all best friends, we took the Greyhound bus, all our first time yeah. on a Greyhound, and we went from Purdue to New York. We stayed in a hostel in Times Square, also the first time, and I went to my interview, They had, we all had interviews, and literally that same day, Fleischman Hillard, who was number one at the time, called me back and was like, do you want this internship? And I immediately was like, yes. I was like, I'm not even going to the other interviews. This like, is it. This is it. And what do you think they saw in you? Because I know a lot of people, when they think about landing that internship or landing that job, have a lot of questions about what someone's looking for. What did they see in Kendra that you think landed you that internship? You know, it's so funny because 
I try and tell people, yes, there's this thing about who you know. Everyone gets so caught up in who do you know and that's how you got it. I knew no one. Mm -hmm. I literally just mailed in a resume. And I think it was just like my drive, my hunger, also being adaptable mm -hmm. because sometimes, and I see it with people now, it's like, you think you know everything. Yeah. And so there is this confidence level, right? You have to have confidence to look someone in the eye when you're that young, to come to New York on a Greyhound bus. But then you also have to be able to listen and you have to say, I'm here to work for you. I'm here yeah. to add value to you. What can I do? Yeah. And I think internships are the most valuable because you do, it's the one time whenever you are there to really help someone else in a way that's different, even when it's an entry level position, yeah. you have so many expectations. Yeah. As an intern, you ask questions, you sit in meetings, no one's really threatened by you. Yeah. So you get to soak up so much. And the bar is pretty low too, because yes. let's be honest, most interns who go in there don't perform at that level. So yes. I think you almost set yourself apart once you do get that internship, if you show up with that yes. work ethic, you know, I had was at Christie's for over 20 years and there were so many interns along the way. And there are very few that I remember distinctly, but the yes. ones who came in and were there to do anything and everything and kind of in lockstep from the minute were the ones that I gave as much responsibility that I, as I would to a team member at yes. that point. I was like, oh, you're part of the team as long as you're here because I trust you. Yes. And I think as an intern, if that's what you show up and you show up in such a big way, you will find people who are always looking for that kind of drive. Well, and I think it's so it's so interesting because to your point, I wanted to make sure, like I raised my hand for everything mm -hmm. and there was a trust that was built. And it's, it's so interesting because the second piece of this, which goes to what you were saying, is that I also decided I was gonna do sports administration, like sports PR. And it was because Kathy Jordan, who was the first black cheerleader at Purdue, became my mentor. I had an internship at the athletic department. My now husband played basketball. We met our freshman year of college, 1998. <laughs> and um, I, Kathy had encouraged me. She was like, you know, I have an opportunity, come and work at the Indiana Pacers. And so through that, I won a scholarship to get my master's in sports administration. And so my husband is actually from Indianapolis. So I was like, this is great. I'm gonna work at the Indiana Pacers. I'm still gonna do PR, I'm gonna like, get married, and then Fleischman called me back, and we had graduated, and they said, we have a job for you, but you have to move in two weeks. Yeah. And so, to your point, I stood out. I was the only one like who came back from that class, and you know, there's so many interns, and I had two weeks to make a decision that forever changed my life, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm giving back my scholarship, not gonna work at the Pacers, I'm gonna move to New York, Carpe and diem, here carpe we go. Carpe diem. Yeah. And it was just such a moment because my family was like, we don't have the money to get you there. We don't know anybody there. You have to kind of figure it out. And I found the nuns housing and they had corporate housing for, you know, per young professional women of need. And it's funny because my friends, like my, you know, lifelong friends, like Shanae, we were friends in seventh grade. They're, they're like, you're always about carpe diem. I feel like at some point I heard it and but it is about seizing the day, yeah. you know? And it's like, I firmly believe that God for me, which is what I believe in, gives you these voices, these opportunities if you're open and receptive. Yes. And so you hear the voice or you get the tap and then it gets quieter and quieter and quieter as you miss out on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll never forget and not to jump ahead, but when I was at Ralph Lauren and I was trying to figure out about leaving or going, like that was one of the big things that, the chief of staff said to me, she was just like, you can always come back. You can always do something else. You can always change your narrative, right? Yeah. But if you don't even attempt to do what has been placed in your heart to do, then that's when you lose your confidence. You never get that moment back. Other moments will come, yeah. but it just won't be that one. Yeah, that's such a great, great piece of advice. So you alluded to going to Ralph, but before that, Tell us about what you were doing in those early years in PR, because it really was building the base for you for what you've done over the course of your career. It's funny because people ask me a lot about mentors and sponsors and champions, and I always credit 
Heidi Hovland, who ran the consumer group, who gave me the shot, and Alan Rambam. And it's so funny because we think about women as advocates, and then we have our allies and men. Mm -hmm. And in those early days, I remember I started and there was like 26 like assistant account executives. Like there was a huge class of us. Mm -hmm. And I was literally like the last one standing in the end. And it's like when I was an intern, I raised my hand for everything. Mm -hmm. I volunteered. I remember all my friends were going on some trip and they asked the team was like oh we have this big event do you want to work it and i was like oh i'm going on vacation and i was like well i can go on vacation another time yeah and like it's these sacrifices that paid off and i had i mean incredible opportunities i helped build the digital practice group at flies when i built them i helped build the mom's group before i was a mom (laughs) um but we were so ahead and we were doing what we call digital PR. And so MTV was was one of my clients. And, and what the, year is this? I mean, give us context as is, to what's going on. Because oh, yes. I think this is the most interesting part, too. These, this is 2002. So I interned in 2001. 2002, my first clients were Black Planet, Mahente, and Asia Avenue. The original social networking sites, pre-Facebook even. Oh, my gosh. And it was these communities of interest. And I remember Alan being like, this is the future. And so we called it digital PR. And that's why we were going into message boards and forums. You know, if we think about what's happening now, the original bloggers were women because you had all these moms who were finding these message boards and chat rooms because they were trying to create communities. And so fast forward to, I still remember when Facebook launched, actually before Facebook was MySpace. Yeah. And MySpace MySpace. was literally like, MySpace came out and we were in this conference room, you know, the boardrooms and everyone's brainstorming. And and I raised my hand as this assistant account executive. And I said, what about MySpace? And everyone's like, MySpace? And I'm like, yeah. So my boss is like, cool, we're going to California. We're going to meet with these guys in this like little room. And at this point, 2003, we created the first mobile music studio. And at the time, we were working with Singular, which everyone yeah. knows today as at and yes. And we created ringtones. So MySpace was all about music and everyone was releasing music. We brought in Singular and we essentially created a three-way deal where Singular made money, the artists made money, and MySpace made money when people were buying ringtones. And so it's funny, 2003, 2004, we were doing these mall tours. You had to show your phone to get in. And it was the foundation of kind of what I'm building now, communities of interest, innovation through social media, and how do you monetize a whole new community of people so that everyone is winning? And that was all between 2002 and literally 2007. And during that time, I remember, and I say mentorship is one thing, championship is one thing. We have to be careful what we expect from people Mm -hmm. in order to build our dreams. We have to know what to take and what to give. And Alan, I'll never forget, we were going to Korea and literally they wanted us, we were going to Tokyo, Korea, and Hong Kong. And they wanted us to ride in separate cars. He had an interpreter. I didn't. I had helped write the presentation, but they didn't want me to speak. When we got to Hong Kong, I was literally like the only black woman. I was like, if I don't go to this meeting, everyone's going to know I played hooky because I'm the only one here. And they wouldn't let me come in. And he was like, no, she's going to speak. She's going to have an interpreter. This is her work just as much as as it is mine. And I always think about that voice and the people and the champions. Was he my mentor? He was my boss. He was running a global business unit, but taking the time to support those around us and the confidence that he had in himself, but the confidence that he had in me. Yeah. And I think about those years and it was it was hard. Like leaving Fleischman was hard because I had grown so fast. I became the youngest vice president, but I knew I wanted to go in house. And I knew I was like, this has been a great experience. I even thought, talking about your mom, I thought I was gonna move to London. I had written in my review, I'm moving <laughs> to the London office. Here I come. Yes, here I come. So you did just mention this. So I wanna ask this question. You were black at this mm-hmm. time yeah. in a world that was all white mm-hmm. and frankly, probably all men yes. for the most part. So how did that affect your confidence yeah. or was a mentorship with Alan or this relationship you had with someone who was championing you in such a big way? Did that allow you to step into a confidence or were you finding a lot of times like, wait, where am I? Who am I in this? You know, yes. I'm sure that there was a lot of that, too. It was really 
it was really hard. And I think that when you're in it, you're just doing so much to survive yeah. and to like have your place and to stand up for yourself. And it's like, you want to be great, but then not too great. And yeah. you want to speak, but you don't want to speak too much. And like, I spent a lot of my career because I was advanced, but I was advanced because I was adding value. Yes. I was advanced because I was doing the work. Yeah. And it's always an interesting thing when we think about race and we think about affirmative action and we think about who's at the table because of their skill set or because of a quota. And I remember like this very senior woman being like, you're meant to be here. You're on my team. I was called into every new business pitch, everything. And I remember being like, why am I here? Because on the other side of that, every time I would have to go into a presentation, it would primarily be white men. Mm -hmm. As soon as I walked into the room, can you get me a, a coffee? Yeah. Where's the printout? Yeah. And he's going to scribe this meeting. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, no, I'm actually the presenter. Yeah. And having to see people's face where they're so uninterested. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a place where they're like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. Yeah. It doesn't always mean that you get invited, but you know that you've unlocked it and they know that you're smart. Yes. And you can see it whenever you've hooked it. Yeah. And it's, it's really it's psychologically damaging because you know that you're great, but there's all these forces that actually have nothing to do with you yeah. in terms of what people are used to seeing. I couldn't even really articulate in a powerful way what I was good at until after I started my first company. And so that was after doing all these things at Fleischman, after being the first director of digital media at Ralph Lauren, after, after, to when I could finally, and it was a white woman mm. who I was like, how in the world? this chick and I was like and that was literally what gave me the confidence to understand the difference in terms of saying I'm good at this I'm confident in myself in this mm. and in not being about me 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 or ego or I think I'm better than and there's a fine line and difference that is women it's like she's bragging it's like no I'm not bragging these are facts yeah I'm good at this exactly exactly oh I love the way you just said that it's so true is you're like this is unequivocal yes I'm good at this I would be good at this as a man I would good, I'd be yes. good at this in any in any shape or form exactly. um, and I think a lot of that confidence is stepping into that yes. and feeling like you own that and you stop yes. looking around you for affirmation yes that's it tell me a little bit about working at Ralph Tell me a little bit about that journey and how you ultimately left. Oh, I like credit and I always, I don't even, Ralph Lauren clearly is like being Ralph Lauren. Um, but <laughs> Riding horses. Yes. And like always being chicly dressed as and, he does. Exactly. Like hair and Playing plays. polo. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, so Julie Berman, who at the time was head of corporate communications, she ultimately hired me and I had this really dynamic role as the first director of digital media. And I reported into David Lauren mm -hmm. and I sat with the comms team outside of Ralph Lauren's office. And it was fascinating because Ralph didn't have a computer. And so he would like write us these notes. <laughs> and this is <laughs> like in form <laughs> memo. <laughs> and this is like in 2009. So it's not 2008, 2009. So it's not like computers didn't exist. Let's right. just yeah. <laughs> Like, there was the opportunity was to the have opportunity. a computer if one wanted but one. But you yeah. did not need one. Yes. So it was like, that's totally fine. Um, and it was, a, it was such an amazing experience. Like coming from Fleischman where we had clients, I always loved like the Reeboks where you could go to their big conferences and everyone was wearing the same clothes. And that was one of the things I was always the go-to for beauty and fashion. Mm -hmm. And so when I got recruited to go to Ralph, I was like, oh my gosh, fashion, we're all going to be wearing the same clothes. It's going to be amazing. And it was, it was a lot of hard work. I was a team of one. And because of the structure, David Lauren insisted I report into every single department head. Oh, and oh, so it was not fun. <laughs> yes. And it was funny. So many cooks in the kitchen. So many cooks. <laughs> and when I was leaving Flies, when I remember the GM, who was fantastic, a woman at the time, she said, I just don't want you to be bored. Mm. Like you're on every committee. You do so much. When you go in house, you're only working for one brand. She was like, I just don't want you to be bored. So I remember telling her, I was like, oh, this Little is do no you boring. Know. <laughs> I'm in everyone's general. I work on every brand, every licensed business. And it was great because I was launching the brand on social media. I was doing their first global influencer campaigns. So I would sit with David Lauren for hours and we'd be looking at blogs, looking at blogs. But then Roger Farah, who was the CFO, I'd have to explain like 
how much money are we making on social media? Mm -hmm. So back then, I'm like running a Facebook ad and I'm making like $200. And I'm like, okay, billion dollar company. And then I remember every time Colleen Rizzo, who had headed up advertising, every time a magazine would fold, I'd be like, can I get some of those dollars? Social media isn't free. And like trying to bring in agencies. And it was phenomenal. Like we opened the restaurant in Paris. We went to London and... David had created Merchantainment. And it was also at that time that I started to learn that the bloggers had better traffic than ralphlauren.com. And it was at the start of blogging. So at this Mm. point, there's no Instagram, there's no YouTube, it's true form blogging. And I started talking more and more about these blogs and we need to pay attention. and, And it was just it was a moment that I didn't even know that I was manifesting. Mm. I just saw it and I knew it. You saw that white space. I saw that white space. And because David insisted that I work with every department, I was in a meeting with Club Monaco Mm -hmm. and they had hired this social media freelancer, Karen Rabinovitz. And Karen and I met, hit it off instantly. And because at that time, nothing could happen on social without someone talking to me. So I meet Karen three months, two, three months, I woke up one Saturday morning and I said to my husband, I cannot stop thinking about this woman. This is so crazy. And I texted her. She called me and I said, I have an idea to manage bloggers. And she said, me too. We put up a website that day. She's like, I have this name, Digital Brand Architects. We put up a website that day, got our husbands together for brunch Sunday the next day, Filed for an LLC Monday. Oh my gosh. I went to David and was like, I'm going to manage bloggers. And him and Julie were like, we don't know what that means. Yeah. And he ultimately was like, as long as they're wearing Ralph Lauren. And every Friday, we go to the Standard Hotel and meet packing, and we'd meet with the bloggers and be like, where Ralph Lauren? Like, I talk a lot about in my new book, um, The Beauty of Success, about being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And at every turn, I started to realize, Fleischman, I'm helping build the digital practice group. Ralph Lauren, I'm the first director of digital media. I'm building things as an entrepreneur within a company. With an existing structure, the the four walls. Exactly. And it it was funny because when we were building Digital Brand Architects, because I was working at Ralph Lauren, I had the safety net of both Mm. and I was going back and forth and I was using this to do that. And then there just became this moment where we were like, we're really onto something. This is the future. And what decision are you going to make? And it was back to Carpe Diem and kind of what I said earlier. And it was just this moment of like, do we step out in faith or do we stay? And I tried for a long time to do both. Yeah. And it just was that moment where we took the leap and we had to do it. And I thought, I mean, I I literally, my children were going to be wearing little polos. Yeah, like, I, I was sold, drinking a Kool-Aid, like, head here, to toe. I live yes. in plaid. Everything I have is flannel. Yes, exactly. Thank God for fall and winter yes. and it all makes sense. Oh, my gosh. I remember my first tie. I was yeah. like, this is everything. <laughs> You're like literally like walking around in equestrian boots with a long flowing yes. dress on a horse. And oh, then, yes. Where did this horse come from? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And the sample sales. It was just, it, uh, yes. I literally just recently got rid of some of my boots that I had had all those years. Shouldn't have done that. They will be back in 10 years. <laughs> yes. Trust me. There's nothing in my wardrobe that has not come back in. Exactly. I mean, my God, if the, the what are the, everyone I saw earlier this year, the white shirt over the jog bra oh, and the God. short spandex shorts. And I yes. wanted to say to people, which I didn't, but I wanted to say, listen, I promise you when you look back in pictures in 20 years, you're going to be really sad that you wore that. <laughs> and I know because I look back. Because I, that was the me. The pictures that I took in college and I really regret that. So yes. I'm not going to say anything because I think it's lived experience, but like oh you're not going to appreciate that look. Doesn't I hold up. That. Doesn't hold up. <laughs> so you take the leap of faith and you and Karen start this. How quickly does it start to prove to be a success? It's so funny because... So much of it was, what are you guys talking about? Who are these people? Do Mm. they sit in their room? And it was just quickly. We went from like not getting anyone to understand the world of bloggers Mm. to ultimately starting the first power pinner division and people starting to see it. Because once you look at the data, that's what I learned at Ralph. I had to learn Google Analytics so that I could explain to a CFO, like, let's look at engagement and conversion and CAC and the fact that this one actually has more traffic to their blog than to our website which Mm -hmm. means they can help us drive conversion and all of these different pieces. And so when we started introducing that to the brands, it started to be like, oh, I mean, we were doing 
baby deals at the time. Mm -hmm. But when you look at some of the people that we were working with back then, like something Navy, who is now in Nordstrom and a darling, like Christelle Lim, all of our early talent. It's so funny because Tina Craig Bagsnob, I was just at a dinner with her and she was telling everyone, Kendra was my first manager. Kendra was my first. Now Tina has like a multi-million dollar empire. She has her own beauty brand. She's like selling out left and right on QVC. And it's, it, there was another blogger I ran into in the airport and she was like, Kendra, she was like, you literally changed my whole life and my career. And it was just because we believed and we had insight in something. And so we saw it take off. We brought in Raina Panchansky, who runs the company now as our third partner. We opened in LA and we just started building. And, and how, did you find, how did you choose the bloggers? Like, what was it about them? Was it a star quality? Was it something different? Like, what was it that made you want to pick the ones that you chose. So it's it's funny that you asked me that because as I'm learning now that I have a venture fund and I have to <laughs> invest in people, I'm a good picker. Yeah. There's something about the picking and the gut and understanding people. And I remember as we started growing, people would call us all the time because we were the only ones doing it. This mm-hmm. is in 2010, you were managing bloggers. Mm-hmm. And I remember being like, but it has to be something more than taking pictures of yourself. Yeah. And so I started to institute this plan where people would go through, like, where do you see yourself? Do you want to write a book? Do you want to have a TV show? Do you want to have a line? Like, let's plot out the future mm. beyond you taking a photo because that's not sustainable. Yeah. And so it was about the vision. It was about understanding where does this person want to show up for themselves? Mm. And the interesting thing is that the bridge between the bloggers and influencers. And then when, as I started working with celebrities, I worked with Halle Berry for six years as her business partner. And what I started to find as the common thread that I had learned with the bloggers is you can't want it more than the other person. Mm. Like I'm here to help facilitate, to bring your dreams to life, to bring your vision. That's my gift. But you got to do the work. You got to do the work. Yes. And I could stay up and work all night, but if you're not going to do the work, then we can't meet. And I started to figure that out early on as we were picking people. How do you show up? Mm -hmm. Do you come with questions? Do you come with agenda? Do you have ideas, but then do you understand the difference between an idea and an execution, Mm -hmm. right? Because anyone can like launch something, but it's like, how do you sustain it? How do you grow? How do you accelerate? Mm -hmm. It's this interesting mix of the data and understanding and then just being a real good cross my fingers picker. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just left Christie's in May to start my own auctioneering agency. And in my, in my role now, I'm essentially a talent agency. And when I first launched it, I had already gone out to a couple of the people that I'd trained over the years at Christie's who I had always believed in and had been referring business to forever. But then there was this huge white space as to who was going to be part of this new agency. And there's that fear factor when you first start, right, where you're like, is anyone want, going to want to do this? You know, And so I sort of had my stable of people who were already in. And then Forbes wrote an article about the fact that I was looking for auctioneers. And I swear to God, 150 people reached out. Wow. These were people that I knew. These were people that I didn't know. And all of a sudden, this idea that I had for tryouts, I immediately was like, I think I need to actually not try out, but actually have people send videos so I know what I'm working nice. with. And now it's become this really interesting thing that I'm watching happen real time where on the auctioneering side... I get to choose what I want. And after 20 years on stage, I know what I'm looking for. And I'm looking for a star. Like, what did you just say? You're looking for someone who isn't just the person who's going to show up, but the person who actually knocks people over. And I don't think I knew that when I started this in May, but I now know that. And I'm already up to 10 auctioneers as a result of that. And those five, I look at it and I'm like, these people are going to have the most unbelievable careers. They don't even know it yet. I know it. But you see it. Oh, I I see it. I have to tell you, I was reading about you and your career and how you started that agency. And I'm like, this is genius. Like, I love founders and creators because it's coming from our place. Yes. Like, I'm a picker, but I don't know anything about auctioneering. And when you think about your career and now saying, what's the next phase of what I know I'm good at and what I'm confident at? It, what you're building is so smart. And I it was so funny because it's a whole other world that I didn't even know existed. I'm like, auctioneers sneak managers? This makes so much <laughs> sense. They're, they're celebrities in their own right. Yeah. And it's creating the market and creating the need and training the nonprofits who up until this point have asked for a donation of time from a meteorologist to understand that there is a 30% return, a 50% return if the person's good on what they're paying wow. 
just to get them on stage. You yeah. know, and I think to your point earlier, once you see a white space in something that you know, I know Jerry Dictionary inside and out. It's like once you see that white space, you can't unsee it. Yes. You know, there's nothing that makes it go away. It sticks in your brain while you sleep and it's the first thing you think about when you wake up. So I love hearing this story because even as someone who's venturing into the entrepreneurial world, it feels right to hear this because yes. it feels like I'm on the right path. So fingers crossed. We'll see. But anyway, <laughs> like back I'm to you, Kendra. You. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like I'm like, is this a therapy session? I can talk? Is this a podcast about Kendra or am I just podcast. asking questions that I want? Um, so DBA obviously turns out to be a huge success and you eventually sell it. Yes. So how did that come to happen? So we um, decided that we needed an investment. We really did. We were going so fast and we needed to bring on managers. And so we ended up bringing on an investor. And it was interesting for me because my co-founders were white women. And I, because I've always lived in like cross-race spaces, Mm -hmm. like it didn't really... I didn't really think anything of it other than I met this woman, we had this great idea. Mm -hmm. But little did I know that I became part of the first group of 100, 200 black women to raise more than a million dollars for their first company. It's amazing. And I didn't. I didn't understand it and I thought we were gonna raise money, I was gonna sit in the boardroom and it was just gonna be this fantastic experience of private planes, but it really wasn't. It was (laughs) not at all. Private planes, It was because when we were recruiting, they did take us on their planes. It was like, okay. And it was also another moment of realizing that you're black Mm -hmm. and that's not gonna change no matter what you do. These people are always gonna see you as a black woman Mm -hmm. and you're always going to have to do more and Mm -hmm. you can show up in these spaces and sit next to your white co-founders, but you're not going to be treated the same. And I learned so much in that experience about people and what I wanted and what I didn't want and that we didn't have an aligned value system. We had a great idea together Mm -hmm. and it's been really helpful even in working with founders. Like, am I a solopreneur or do I have a Mm co-founder? And I think that people have to kind of determine, is it easier to have someone to carry the load? Yes. Does that mean they have to be a co-founder? I don't necessarily agree with that because I've done it both ways and you know, and you know, and you know, and I actually was like, we're not going to align and we're not going to agree. And it's really time for me to figure out what else I want to do. And Raina was so about the business and just in a different mindset than I was. And I was sitting in my office and I was just like, what have I learned? And it was really like such a moment, talk about therapy of intense awareness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I love being around smart people Mm -hmm. and everyone is so smart in so many different ways, but I really only want to work with people that I trust. Mm -hmm. And because we had investors who, you know, were named the most powerful person in Hollywood and we were in that world, there was a lot of things that just weren't real. Mm. And people said a lot of things that they just never intended to do. And I never operated from that. That might be my Texas roots. Yeah. But I grew up with, if you say you're going to do something, then you're going to do do it. it. Right. Yeah. And so I had to grapple with what does integrity mean to me and what does trust mean? And do I want to be in a world where I, I don't really know if you're for me against me, like, what is it? And I wrote brain trust on my whiteboard and I was like, I only want to work with people that I trust. And I believe that that's how we are solve problems. And so I ended up parting ways. They ended up selling the business. Mm-hmm. I ended up like literally going into such an intense conversation because the person that we hired basically tried to erase me from the company, which is also what I talk about in my new book, The Beauty of Success. <laughs> You're like coming out shortly. I'm like coming out through <laughs> 13. Um, but it was interesting because so many people, like even when the company sold and the press came out and was like founded by, and my publicist was calling and the press was like, can you prove that you're the co-founder? And I was like, did you see the New York Times article that came out in 2010 with Karen and I as the co-founders? Did you see the Women's Wear Daily article that said that we hired this woman and then promoted her to partner? And it was such an intense race. It became about race and I was lying and she wasn't because I was a black woman. And I ended up doing this whole thing with LA Times. And it was, the, and it was just such a moment of like, standing in my power and not letting anyone erase you, right? And that people can't have that much power over you. 
And I always say there was room for everybody to be celebrated mm -hmm. because if you hadn't had us who started the company and had the idea and raised the first money, then you wouldn't have been able to sell the company in the future. Yeah. And so it takes everything. And that's what I say to founders now. You may not be the founder who starts the business and ends it because a lot of founders who can get a company to 10 million can't get it to 500 million. Right. It's just not in the DNA. There's some who can. Mm -hmm. And so we all have to be confident in our place of the business, but then we also have to protect ourselves. Yeah. Right. And, and that's really also what I learned in my next business. How do I protect my value and my assets to continue to do what I'm good at? And so when I launched Brain Trust, I was like, I'm not doing talent management. Yeah. I am back to my roots of brand strategy and brand marketing. And I had Halle Berry and Blushington as my first clients. And I just felt so confident in what I was doing. But then I still had PTSD because I just had someone tell me that I didn't start something. And so yeah. then you're kind of like, did I not? And you're like, no, no, no. History I was there. Is there. Yeah. I was there. Yeah. I was at facts. the table. Facts are facts. And it plays with your confidence. And I remember my husband being like, you did it once, you'll do it again. Yeah. You're like, a creator. That's how we're going to roll. Yes. So you started Brain Trust. And since then, Brain Trust has obviously taken off, but it's also taken on other iterations too. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So we still have Brain Trust Agency, mm -hmm. which we started in 2015. So social media marketing. We just won the Beauty Matter Next Influencer Partnership of the Year Amazing. Award. Amazing. Congratulations, Thank you. Kendra. So that was that. And that's like to my roots, like yeah. Gigi Brand and my team. And I'm like, you guys, did we have to do well in this. This is my root. Oh, this is where and it all started. This is where it started with our Cantu Beauty client and Angela Stevens, an award. She's an Emmy Award winning. Wow hairstylist. Um, so we have the agency. And then in 2021, I started Brain Trust Founder Studio. COVID was hard for everyone in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And as we're all trying to survive, I had so many founder friends who were like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And as I started digging into the stats, I'm like, okay, black founders, black women are getting less than 1% of funding. Mm -hmm. Black women start more businesses than any other demographic, mm -hmm. yet our businesses are failing faster. And I started looking at the lack of access, the lack of the lack, the lack, the lack of. And I'm like, no, if I believe in brain trust, which I do, then as a community, we're going to have to solve this. And so I started Brain Trust Founders Studio. We're now the largest membership based platform for black founders, beauty and wellness companies. We have our app. We have our Founders House activation. We do programming. And I built it on the pillars of community, mentorship, education, and capital. All the things that you've All had access to I've along had the way. To. And yeah. you have to, you know, and I, I'm not even being funny about the book. And you have your books. And so you know that when you're writing and you have to really think about what do you stand for and why do people care? Yeah. And the through line for me was you've lived these pillars and every iteration of your life from day one. Yeah. And if you built a company called Brain Trust, I didn't even really connect the community aspect of how I live my life until I sat down to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to mentorship, like what I said from the beginning. It goes back to you constantly have to educate yourself. And then it goes back to capital. You really, as a business owner, you have to think about capital in so many different ways. We instantly go to someone needs to invest in my business with hardcore dollars. And yes, you need money, but you need social capital, you need human capital. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is what is the differentiated sources of capital that we need alongside these other pillars? So that's what the studio stands for. And then as we started to grow, I realized that in order for some of these businesses to pop, they actually needed money. Yeah. I can talk about human and social, but they needed money. And when we looked across the venture landscape, there are not black women raising the type of money we've been raising in beauty and wellness, investing back into black founded companies. And so I went to a few people and I was like, I want to do a fund. And they were like, oh, yeah. Pat on the head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aren't you comms and marketing? You have an MBA. You weren't at the banks and like stick to what you know. And then I'll never forget. I... I, my friends had a birthday party in Cabo and it, it's like a friends, but you know, we're close and we're business close. And my husband was like, why are we doing this? Why are, why are we going? I'm like, I don't know, but I've been praying and something's going to happen. 
as soon as we got there, the first person we saw was Lisa Stone. And I had known Lisa for like almost 20 years. She co-founded Blog Her. I was at the first Blog Hers. I had loved her. She had introduced me to Sally Krawcheck. And she's like, Kendra. And I'm like, Lisa. <laughs> and she's like, I saw what you've been building. Like, how can I help? And it mm. goes back to what I always talk about in terms of allyship. Mm. Lisa is a white woman. She's 10 years older than me. She has had a different life experience, but we always connected. She had Black Lives Matter on her LinkedIn in 2015. Mm. She wrote a paper about how diverse teams perform better. Mm. So as she's doing this and selling her company to Penske, she then went, worked with Sally, helped raise $100 million, then helped raise $125 million at another fund and was like, I really want to do this pivot to purpose. Mm -hmm. Worked throughout the weekend and came back with the construct of what the fund could be. I did not have the confidence at that point. I was kind of like, okay, you're going to do this. And she was like, we can do it. Yeah. And we had a dinner and fast forward, we've closed our first fund. We're getting ready to raise our second fund. And it's the confidence. Like I can actually now, I knew I was good at building a brand. Mm -hmm. I knew I could pick talent. I knew I could create a strategy. But now I'm like, I'm actually a venture capitalist. I know about Add Carta. that to the list. <laughs> I know about due diligence. I'm confident. And I'm confident because I have a great partner and I have an ally. And we talk about there's so much happening with race right now. And there's yeah. so many attacks and this and that. And we credit each other because I'm like, there's people who look at me as a black woman who's gone through this and said, wow, you got a white co-founder. And then I said, but you don't know the other side of how many black people told me that they wouldn't partner with me to do it. So it was really about who believes in the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then you have this white woman who has had an amazing career mm -hmm. who is then saying, I'm going to co-found a fund to invest in black founders. Yeah and racially underrepresented people, I'm not even investing as my first priority in people who look like me. Yeah. And so there's this huge confidence that we both bring to the table every day, true in who we are, true in what we believe, but also in the impact that we're gonna make for people who need it. Yeah. Kendra, I could talk to you all day. I know I, you have to be on a stage somewhere. I'm getting, people are literally like waving at me through the window and I'm so transfixed by every word coming out of your mouth that I don't want this to end. So this will have to be a follow-up coffee, dinner, Thank many you. drinks yes, later. Yes, please. What an incredible podcast. I have learned so much from you. I am so in awe of everything that you've created and I can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom with everyone who's listening right now. Tell me where we can find you. Tell me about the book. Tell me about the podcast. But make it speedy. Otherwise, <laughs> Gigi, your assistant, is going to hop through this window and pull me right out. It's You're a like, problem with having a glass front quick. window. I know, exactly. Well, I am so, thank you so much for having me, giving me the space to share. Um, you can find me at Kendra Bracken hyphen ferguson.com um, my podcast business of the beat is a show that comes out every sunday i talk to bipoc leaders women executives in the beauty and wellness industry who are starting growing and accelerating their brands and my new book oh here my gosh go. Lydia, i'm go. joining your Get club join the, the author pool like, i'm joining the author pool <laughs> my new book the beauty of success start grow and accelerate your brand comes out february 13th it's available for pre-order, Target, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and also at Kendra Bracken-Ferguson.com <laughs> um, through Wiley Publishing. So I'm so excited to join your club. I'm going to pre-order it today because I would love to see this entire roadmap laid out. And I'm sure that there are a lot of stories we didn't get to because this wasn't long enough. But it has been such a pleasure. I want to thank you again for coming on. I want to thank my amazing producer, Joe, for also <laughs> waving me in and telling me I had to stop <laughs> asking questions, even though I have another list. Um, and I want to thank Rocket Center for letting us have this amazing studio, newsstand studio. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. I will be back with you next Tuesday with another wonderful guest. But in the meantime, Kendra, thank you for coming. And instead of asking a question this week, I'm just going to say to everyone who's listening, carpe diem. Have a great week. <laughs>